Podcasters. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have an idea episode. I'm very excited for this one. We're going to be talking about simplifying sales for industry. And I have with me the expert himself, Mr. Mike Weinberg. And I tell you what, guys, he is a consultant, sales coach, speaker, author, on a mission to simplify sales. And, I, and his book, I got it right here for those that are checking us out on YouTube, the one that really impacted me, Sales Management Simplified. I picked this one up, read it cover to cover, implemented a lot of these principles that Mike talked about into to my practice. And it, it was a game changer. It really was. And you know, Mike has several other books. We're going to unpack some of those areas. We'll have all those resources in the show notes for, for you guys to go to and check that out. But I'm just excited. So Mike, you're coming out of uh, of St. Louis, and you know you have a co- three young adult children. You know you got your wife Katie there. You're doing, and you said it. I, I loved it in your bio. That's your best proof that you can really sell, right? Absolutely. Nobody meets Katie and thinks that she got a better deal with me. So, absolutely. <laughs> and what a treat! Thanks for thanks for tracking me down. People seem to love your show, and I'm real excited to visit with you and talk about sales and sales leadership. So, Chris, thanks for having me. Oh, it's, it's the pleasure is all ours. It's, it's all ours. And, I, you know, when I got your book a couple of years ago, it really made an impact on me. So I'm excited and, and maybe just kick us off when people hear the word sales, you know, I'm holding the air quotes up for those listeners out there. Sometimes it, it's a bad rap. You, you know, why do you think that is? Well, it's deserved. I mean, <laughs> look, look at the quality of, of, of sales that's going on around us. And, and the way I like mm-hmm. to say it is we didn't create the problem, but we've got to live with it, right? We didn't cause mm-hmm. it, but we are swimming in this poison water because the the stereotypical view of the salesperson is of is either of a time waster or a manipulator, right? Or someone who's self-interested. And what makes me so crazy about that, that's the that's the antithesis of what a professional seller who leads with integrity and is out there to help the customer win, right? So mm-hmm. there's a lot of reasons I think people are anti-sales or or resistant, because there's a lot of goofballs that have screwed it up and they've they've wasted prospects' time or they've been, you know, self-focused or you know, maybe less than high integrity and all of those things are just mm-hmm. absolutely, you know, they'll, they'll shoot your sales effort in the foot, right? There's no coming back from, from wasting someone's time or being low integrity. So I think that's probably why sales has that reputation, which frankly drives me crazy because I couldn't mm-hmm. be more proud to be in sales and I love the sales profession. Absolutely. You know, and it's got, when it reflected, it's all about you. It's you totally missed the boat. It's it's all about the people you're serving in sales, and that's why I feel like the best salespeople that I've had a pleasure to work with and engage with, they're they're just serving their customer. They're trying to really understand where they're at, and 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 it's totally not about them. You said it. You said it when we were just chit chatting before we came on the air, right? About servant leadership and and what our goal is. I mean, before thirty years ago, I I left New York and I moved to the Midwest to St. Louis to get into sales, and my dad was like a big time New York City sales executive. And he sat me down. He's like, Mike, you need to hear me on this. Your job in sales is to make your customer as successful as possible. Like if that's your motivation to help the customer win, you're always going to win. And, and I can tell you, Chris, that advice has served me so well as a salesperson mm-hmm. and now as an author and a coach, because when you, when you have your customer's best interest at heart, they can mm-hmm. smell that on you and they know that you're for them, right? You're not trying to put one over on them. You're trying to benefit them in, in some way. And that that is exactly what professional consultative, you know, sellers who are trusted advisors, that's what motivates them. And that's how they behave. That's right. That's right. And, I, I'm, and I'm thinking through now, you know, sales organizations, and we're one, you know, we we're, we serve the industrial market and we just add the complexity that I don't think it needs to be there. You know, instead of just trying to serve, we try to come up with these new cutting edge ideas and ways that the market's going to be. And, and, and you know, why, why do we do that? I mean, how, how do you see these organizations doing that? I don't know. Like, what's funny, I, I have some really smart friends that are consultants and I have some really smart clients, but I went to New York public schools and I was an average student. Like, I, I, don't, I don't know how to make anything complicated. I, I think I got by trying to simplify things. Right. Because to me, like, I don't know if there's anything simpler than, than sales, right? They have a need or a problem mm-hmm. or a desired outcome. We have a potential solution. Let's get together and talk about it and see if we can help you, if we can bring you some value. Like that's mm-hmm. about 80% of what I know about sales right there. And yet everybody wants to make it really complex and build all these models and frameworks and processes. And honestly, I don't get it. I don't get it. And here's the one thing I will tell your, your listeners. The people who try to tell me that sales is really complicated, really complex, usually they make it that complicated because either they don't know what they're doing 
or they they kind of put this complexity out there as a smoke screen. So That's you can't it. see through the the crap and realize they're not really trying. Like, you know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Like, I don't, mm-hmm. I don't understand why it's so hard. Cause I've got some really, really complex clients, like defense, major distribution, big data, um, huge companies that their business is complicated. But the act of selling isn't complicated, right? And that's what I'm trying mm-hmm. to always help people sort out. Your business may be nuts, but selling is about being proactive. It's about working a good list, having a good story, making a friend, asking questions. Like that's about all it is. Mm-hmm. So that's that's right. You know, it really does something. It's, it's I, so I love your titles too. Simplified. You're know, just just getting it down to simplifying. And and when I was reading, you know, part of your book and preparing for today, you know, something that jumped out was that that sales follows strategy. And I really wanted you to unpack that for our listeners out there because I think this is something that we miss a lot of times. So, what, what are you trying to hammer home when you, when you when you point that out? No one. I love you asked me that. No one ever asked me that question. I mean, I the hundreds of people have interviewed me about this book. No one's ever asked about sales follow strategy. So, I love that you you picked that. Um, I wrote that in frustration because mm-hmm. in my consulting practice, and then in the last company I worked in before I left because I was so frustrated, I, I was living as a sales leader just aggravated every day that the company couldn't tell me where to go, what markets to serve, what our value proposition is, like what customers we should be pursuing for business or prospects. And I'm always reminding executives that strategy is your job and the salespeople's job is to execute your strategy. Because here's what I'll say, Chris, I never see a new business development focused sales attack succeed. Like I don't see sales teams going out and bringing in a lot of new business when those sellers, those salespeople are not crystal clear about what they're selling and to whom they're, sh- they're supposed to be selling it. like, And it sounds ridiculous that I even have to say that, but there are companies where their strategy is in flux or the industry is changing or they let salespeople kind of go rogue and live as entrepreneurs or cowboys out there making it up. I never see them win. Sales is about execution. Most, most of what we do in selling, and I'm not insulting you or me as salespeople, mm-hmm. but most of what we do in sales is not brain work. It's execution, it's discipline, it's relationship, it's influence, right? Mm-hmm. It's problem right. solving. It's not strategy. One of the few times we're strategic is when we're deciding, well, whose business do we want? Like, where do I go for the path of least resistance and most likely right. success? And so right. that's why I say sales should follow strategy because I think it's on leadership, management, and, and executives to point the sales team to the right markets and the right types of customers. And then we got to go get the meetings and bring in the business. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, may, and maybe sometimes I, you mentioned it, you know, the, the salespeople that go rogue or we just let, you know, the cowboys be the cowboys and they go do their thing. And some of them are successful. And maybe that drives some of that behavior up top because you know what? It is working over here. So we don't want to upset that apple cart. But, you know, you're missing the point of, but you're the ones who are supposed to be setting the strategy. Yeah. And I think the person you're describing is more the the superstar or like the freak of nature where you've got Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I could see like mm-hmm. you're resonating with what I'm, what I'm saying. You may have a unique freak on your team who can get it all done. They can determine strategy. They can do a, a ton of great selling without a lot of support. The company's mm-hmm. not giving them good messaging or giving them good direction. And because they're naturally gifted, they figure it out. But that's like a few percent of the population. Most people yeah. in sales, my, my argument to management is your people need more support and more direction and more tools and guidance and coaching than we realize. And then instead of blaming them all the time for why they're not bringing in as much business, why don't we equip them and point them and arm them so they can go win? So exactly, that takes work, right? That's that that takes effort on management's part. (laughs) That's right. Well, it takes clear direction too. And I mean, you have to set the strategy. I mean, there's an old proverb where there's no vision the people perish. And there's that, that goes directly to what you're saying here exactly to it so preach absolutely absolutely well i'll try not to preach too much on this show but you know what, 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 I, did, I think there's a lot of value in that and i tell you one thing when you were talking about strategy the next thing that came to mind was stories because if it, a good salesperson they need to be able to tell a story and they need to be clear articulate to a point and you really you make that you call it a game changer and and, and, as, and as the importance of it so uh, who should be writing those stories and 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 how can a sales story really you know take it to the next level you just like touched on my favorite topic. So let, let's go down that path. You know, there's, okay. there's a couple of ways the word story gets used. One way is the way you started describing it is the art of telling a story. Super mm-hmm. powerful in sales, right? Because people relate to your stories. It makes you relatable. And you're mm-hmm. telling stories of how you've helped other customers and 
maybe the jams they were in that you rescued them from or the results that you've achieved. And that's like proof. Everybody wants to hear uh, you tell that story. I also Mm -hmm. use the story in a slightly more generic sense where I'm like, your story, your pitch, your value prop, it's a collection of talking points you use, whether it's in writing when you're prospecting or in a voicemail or face-to-face or in a PowerPoint Mm -hmm. slide or a proposal. All of those, I argue, are elements of what I refer to as our sales story. And it's Mm -hmm. your most important weapon because it shows up everywhere, right? Like when your story is great, everything in sales is easier. You're confident. You justify your price. You're willing to prospect and get meetings. When you sit down with someone, you can position yourself as the expert and the problem solver, not just some vendor pitching a product, right? Especially Mm -hmm. in the industrial world that I've got a lot of equipment manufacturers and dealerships I work with and they're always leading with the product instead of leading with the outcome that they're achieving, right? The problems Mm -hmm. they're solving, the risk they're reducing, the profitability they're increasing. So when I say story, I'm like, what the heck do you say or write when you're trying to justify what you bring to the market, your value? Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I don't think companies put enough work into that. And you, you asked a great question. Who should be writing those stories? Everybody. The salespeople, Mm -hmm. the sales manager, the owner, the marketers. I think we need to get in a room. We need to hash it out. We need a whole list of compelling talking points that are mostly about the issues we address for customers and the outcomes we achieve. And if Mm -hmm. we have customer issue and customer outcome focused talking points that describe, hey, we help people who struggle with A, they want to achieve B, they're stuck with C, they're looking to experience result D, you can fill in those blanks everything changes for you as a seller because you're so confident. And the moment you speak, instead of getting that resistance, oh, look, another product pitch man. They're like, oh, oh, you help people with those challenges? You help your customers get those results? Huh? You help people like me and companies like mine. I want to know more. And I I can't say it any better than that. Like when your messaging is good, you're ready to sell. And it accomplishes so much for you. You really are. You know, I, I'm, I'm thinking too, just as recent as last week, we went on site with our show, Eco Asks Why, and it was a, it was a, a big success of a solution that a customer had a problem. We did, we helped engineer a solution, and this was, you know, it, it really helped them. So I, so I asked the customer, would you mind telling us that story? Because there may be other people like you, a similar boat, trying to do modernization, and they may be able to learn from your wisdom, uh, just 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 sharing with us. So we, we just walked it from soup to nuts on how they, you know, how the, how the project came to be, the hurdles they had, the headwinds, how they overcame them, the, the KPIs that were important. And I, and I, I can't help but feel that that's going to serve the market that we're trying to serve very well. Oh, Chris, that, first of all, that's brilliant because what you did there, and this is something I ask salespeople to do, go ask your best customers to tell you why they bought from you in the first place and why have they stayed right. with you and how have you improved their business and how have you improved their life because they're going to say things. I'm sure when you ask that customer for their testimonial to tell the story, mm-hmm. they probably said things about you and, and the value that you and your organization delivered that you wouldn't have even thought of. Or they're going to say it stronger than you would. And plus, it's authentic because it's coming out of their own mouth. And then all you got to do is spin that around when you're selling and tell someone else, you know, one of my customers just told me we solved this problem and we achieved this result. Right. And then it's like, instead of you bragging, it's like you're giving yourself this third-party endorsement, right? You're, give, you're saying, um, customers are telling me we're helping them with A and we're achieving B. You got any of that mm-hmm. going on? We should talk. And then, oh my That's gosh, right. the, whole, the whole thing is different because then they're not resisting. They're like, really? Oh, well, I got that challenge or I want that outcome. Tell me more. And then right. they view you so differently. Now you're that partner, right? To lead right. them down that path. So I love that you, you told that story because that's where you, you embellish your story and you, you build it by getting your customers to tell you how great you are. Right. That's right. And that's, it's so much power in that. And, and I tell you, one thing I want to ask you about, Mike, because I really want to get your input on this here, because it's been my style all along, but, but people say, well, it's natural for you to, to ask questions because you're a podcast host. Well, I haven't been a podcast host my whole life. You know, I, just, I didn't just wake up, you know, <laughs> starting to do podcast hosting. I was actually selling business development. And, but my style has always been very inquisitive. And just because I, I, I generally care about where people are. And just a point blank question. Is the art of question asking dead? Is it, have you seen, is it, is it dead out there? Wow. I, I love how you frame that. Is the art of asking questions dead? Well, here's my, my snarky answer. If you watched a lot of salespeople on sales calls, you might think it was dead. Mm-hmm. Because what do they do? They show up and throw up. 
the spray and yep. pray. You know, I, I have always been mentored to understand, and now I teach this, that we probably accomplish as much or maybe even more good selling with the questions we ask than by how we present or pitch. Because mm-hmm. when you ask really good questions, you cause the prospect to think and mm-hmm. react and you uncover needs that they may not even know they had. And you're mm-hmm. demonstrating expertise and value like a good consultant or doctor or plug in the professional. But if you watch sales calls, especially virtually, I know one of the things you hinted at we would might get to is, you know, how is the COVID and selling virtually, mm-hmm. how has that mm-hmm. changed? You know, typically when you were in an online meeting, which is something most of us didn't do very much of three years ago. Right. You were only were doing this for a for a demo if you were a software company or a presentation, like, hey, everybody come online and we'll 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 preach at you and pitch to you. That's awful. Because the best sales calls, right? God gave you two ears and one mouth, and that's the right percentage to use them. So if you don't have a good structure for your meetings and you don't ask enough good questions, you just look like you're pitching. And right. the salespeople that have really mastered the virtual selling are the ones who have turned this type of meeting into a dialogue. And it feels mm-hmm. like a normal discovery consultative meeting where it's give and take, like we're selling with them. Mm-hmm. We're not pitching at them. So that was a, right. I kind of want a few places there, but I'm, I'm sure you, there's some places you may want to go down a path, but I don't see enough good questions being asked. And most salespeople kind of do the, the probing to say they did it so they can right. get to presenting instead of really learning what they need to. Right. I, I've literally left meetings with sales management, and this is years, years ago, and and, and salespeople where I just ask questions, and, and I call it discovery fact finding. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I'm I'm really learning because I want to understand where where the, the the inflection point for value is that I could possibly bring because there may not be one. I mean, I think as salespeople we need to realize that too. Not every customer is a good customer, and I've left meetings where the the sales guy we we would get in a car or a truck, whatever, and it's like we. You didn't try to sell them anything. I'm like, because that, that's not the point. That was not the objective. I wanted to learn right there. And did we have another meeting scheduled? He's like, oh, yeah, they gave you a meeting. Then we sold. We, that's, that's we were exactly selling the, right. next, the next conversation, right? Yeah. So tell me, this, why did you ask if questioning was dead? I'd, I'd love to hear what what made you go down that path. Are you seeing the same things I'm seeing? Because, or what? Because, yeah, because when I get on sales calls or go out with, with salespeople and, and I've seen even vendors. So it's, mm-hmm. I'm not just picking on our, on our sales team or, or you know, other sales, but I've seen sales vendors as well. We just go in with brochures and we want to, we want a nice pretty trifold or, or a nice PDF that we can send that's going to, you know, have our logo on it and speak to all these uh, features and benefits. And I actually did a little, uh, I called it a, a rant episode on Eco Ask Why. I called it Straight, call, straight Talk with Chris. And, it, and I said, stop puking features and benefits. And that was the whole rant of, the, of that whole episode. So that's why I brought that up. I'm going to go listen to that one. I, I'm with you. <laughs> Amen. Preach. Yes. The guy that was one of my mentors was the CEO of a company I work for in my, my mid-20s. And he's worth a few billion dollars today. So the guy kind of knew what he was talking about. Yeah. And he we would go on out. sales calls. He was the owner of the company. And as his assistant, I would get to go. And then there'd be the local sales guy like in the market. And we'd go on a sales call. And after the meeting, we'd have a little debrief. And the owner of the company would look at the sales guy who was always so nervous to have to do this the meeting in front of the owner of the company, right? Mm-hmm. And the owner would say, you know, you did such a nice job today presenting our products and our programs. I'm, I'm really proud of you. And I thank you for the effort you put in there. And then he would pause and he would whisper and he'd say, but you talk too much. And when you're talking, we're not learning. Mm-hmm. And God gave you two ears and one mouth. And that's the percent we should be talking on a sales call, about one third. And right. I'm telling you, I was 25 years old when I heard that, you know, and 30 years later, I mean, I think about that almost every day. All the time. All the time. And I, so that's, when you ask that, you know, is, it, is, is asking questions dead? It's probably too dead. And I think we need to resurrect it a little bit. I do too. You know, and I also think, don't just ask just for the sake of asking and checking a box. Cause, and that leads me kind of to my next point with you is the active listening. Cause almost, I feel like sometimes we're just waiting for that point for them to stop talking so we can say what we want to say next versus actively listening the way that I'm trying to do with you right now to have an engaging conversation. But, you know, I just don't see that as a skill that we really hone in on because if questions are important and they're going to lead us down a road that is ultimately going to get us to hopefully where we want to go as salespeople and serve that customer we need to be actively listening. And, and is that a skill that's dead too? And where, where, yeah, where can we know. improve you know, there? 
I, I'm not an expert on active listening and I have to train myself to okay. listen better. Cause like all of us, I'm ready to talk. You know, you, you, you want to get going and start selling. There's, there's two things I will say I share as tips when I'm coaching sellers on conducting more effective sales calls when you're in the probing stage. Mm -hmm. One of them is like as duh as it gets, but take notes. One, it shows respect for the person you're meeting with. Um, and I can't even read my own handwriting, but sometimes I just write stuff down. So I'm communicating that I'm listening and it stops me from right. talking, honestly. The second really best practice is we need to ask secondary follow-up and consequence questions. And one of the things that makes me nuts is the amateur behavior on sales calls. When we ask one simple probing question and we, we find out very quickly that they have a problem that we can solve them with. Mm -hmm. And our gut instinct at that point is the seller is to, is to almost call Go. timeout stop the probing because you know even though you're supposed to yep. go ask the next six questions we get so excited oh my gosh you have that problem let me tell you i can help yeah. you we do this That's that right. and let me show you this great solution and you know you're counting commission dollars and you're drooling and you're so excited that they have the problem that you can solve but what i'm telling you and you know you you know where i'm going with this our oh, instinct yeah. is wrong and just because you smell the blood in the water and you're getting all excited that you want to start pitching the professional mature thing to do is pause and then continue to ask questions. And you've already uncovered they have a pain, right? Maybe they've got a cut. Well, mm -hmm. when they tell you, I got problem A, the most appropriate response is now, well, we can fix that. Let me tell you how we fix that. The mature professional answers, okay, so you have that issue. Well, tell me a little more about that. Mm -hmm. And how long has that been going on? And what's that costing you? And you, you, know, you ask three or four little follow-up questions because what you're doing is you're digging into that wound and you're mm -hmm. building your ROI case. Mm -hmm. You want to understand why they have this problem and what it's costing them and why haven't they fixed it? Because when you come back with your solution, especially if you're more expensive than the next guy, you need to have this justification that, well, you have all these problems and you have all this cost. And because you did your mature probing, you now understand how deadly it is for them not to fix this. And when you bring your solution along, you can clearly articulate why it's worth it to them. So that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons we, we listen, but we've got to ask those follow-up questions. Mm-hmm. And it's so important. I mean, I just, and I feel like that's, that's an area we all, you know, in, in many ways, we just need to lean into that more to follow up the clarification. I always, I always associate it to when you go to the doctor, you know, a doctor doesn't come in and just start prescribing pills. I mean, there's a, there's a list of questions. And as you ask, answer those questions, that's going to lead them down this path. And that's going to lead him down this path. And eventually we're going to get to wait, maybe you do need this prescription, but we're not just going to come in and start just writing a, a pull out the pad and like, here you go, sir. Okay, you're killing me because I use the similar metaphor when I'm teaching sales call stuff. I, I love that you said that. And I never heard anybody else really say it that way because, I mean, just play this out. Let's just take Chris's analogy to a whole nother level. You're going to a doctor. You don't feel good. You've got some mystery illness mm -hmm. and you're sitting there waiting for the doctor to come in. They finally come in the room and close the door. And, he's, and instead of examining you and saying, hey, why don't you start getting undressed and tell me why you're here and what, what brought you in? He just starts telling you about how great he is. Right. And this is where I went to medical school and here's where I did my residency and this is my specialty. And like, okay, great. That's nice, doc. Why are you going to ask me what's wrong? And then instead of examining you, he goes and gets like a sample out of the cabinet and goes, hey, I got this new wonder drug. It's unfreaking believable, man. It is so good. The trials were amazing. This is probably going to fix your issue. Let me write your prescription for this. And right. like I say that, and it's the dumbest analogy I could come up with because that doctor is committing malpractice, right? Like, like, Prescription without diagnosis is medical malpractice. But don't right. our salespeople do almost the same thing as what you're describing? Yeah. Like, right. that's sales malpractice. We go in and we're ready to pitch a storm. But if we don't really learn, how could they trust you? There's that's no right. way you could be the consultative seller if you walk into pitch mode. That's right. I mean, it's the whole square peg in a round hole. You know, we don't even know if they have a hole. It's mostly <laughs> <laughs> we're, trying, we're trying to just to force something. It's just, you know, and also uh, I, I relate it to, to dating and marriage, you know, and, and you only get, you don't get married on the first date. That's a process. And I mean, you have to work up, man. You don't just walk in and say, we're getting married. No, it, you, you, All right. you work. There's a lot of questions there. So now you triggered me. So can I ask you a question back? Cause let's go down this path one more step. I love turning around when I'm being interviewed. Cause okay. I, I think you have an angle on this along with not seeing them ask questions. Here's what else I'm seeing. I'm seeing wimpy salespeople that think if they play yes man or yes woman and order taker, they'll score obedience points and start winning bigger deals. 
Mm-hmm. And I don't see like the customer says, Hey, come give me a dog and pony show, or let me have your equipment list or price this for me, even though we did no discovery work. The salespeople are so quick to want to please them thinking, Oh, I'm going to make a friend. And like, they'll pet me on the head. Like I'm a golden retriever. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, wait a second, just cause he asked you to quote it. I, I take the attitude that you take, like, well, what if that's not the right solution? Shouldn't we mm-hmm. dis- discover this together? And like, I'm curious if you see wimpy, they're more concerned with being like than winning or pushing back and, and demonstrating value. Cause I'm, I'm seeing a lot of that in the industrial world. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I call it sales abuse. I mean, and those guys, <laughs> tell me what you mean. I love that. <laughs> well, I mean, well, think about it like this. I mean, how many of us have had clients and we, we want to serve them, we want to help them, but all we end up being is just a checkpoint, mm. uh, you know, a checkpoint on pricing, a pr- checkpoint on availability, but they really is no intent to really pursue a deeper relationship. You know, we'll get a PO every now and then. Uh, they'll, they'll keep enough to, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the girl in high school who strings you along and she winks at you every now and then. And you just, you don't want to date, date any other girls because you there may be a possibility I'm going to date you at some point, but you never really get the date, right? You just, you, you get a wink every now and then. So that's, I, that, I see that totally. That's so good. I, I'm asking salespeople along those lines. Are you a vendor or are you a value creator? Because you're mm. acting like a vendor. Right. You, mm-hmm. you look like a commodity seller the way you behave. You look like you're there to take an order and quote a price, not to solve a problem. And mm-hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a nuance, like the way I'm saying it. But it's, I see so many people that they're either scared to push back or they don't own their own process. And they think if they rock the boat, you know, they're going to be in danger. And I think, honestly, sometimes rocking the boat and pushing back on the customer is what shows them that you sell with abundance mentality and that you, you want to get them the best solution. And that right. they're like, oh, this guy's different. He, he's actually trying to solve my problem, not just get an order out of me. That's a big difference. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Big difference. Big difference. Well, I'll tell you what, you mentioned this earlier about compensation for salespeople. Because sometimes, I mean, let's face it, <clears throat> you know, we're, 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 we're chasing orders. They're the, the, our compensation programs, the way that we're, we're paid definitely impacts our behaviors. But I love how you put compensation and complacency start with the same letters. It didn't, you just, you just call it out. So, you know, speak to that. How do sales leaders need to respond to this to drive those activities? Cause I'm all about activities that, that are going to ultimately lead to the results that we're looking for. Well, it's, I'll say this to start, cause you just opened a giant can of worms, right? Compensation is a big topic, right? And everybody gets really nervous when we start talking about it, but it's really hard to outmanage a stupid compensation plan. That's not driving the desired behaviors and results. I don't care how great a manager you are and how forceful or how wonderful personality or how great a coach you are. If your comp plan is creating complacency, and I'll talk about that in a second, you're screwed because the best Mm -hmm. people are the best at work on the compensation plan. And truly, I'm taking credit for making this discovery. I, I was getting ready for a CEO meeting, a bunch of CEOs in a room. And I was creating a PowerPoint slide and I wanted to talk to them about, about compensation because a couple of them had, had given me a heads up. They, they felt like they had a challenge. And I typed the word complacency and compensation into the slide. And I'm like, look at that. The first four letters are the same, C-O-M-P. And I'm like, I, I, from that point on, I always tell sales, sales leaders and execs, like if you have complacent salespeople, you better look at your comp plan. And, and part of is I just have a few pet peeves. But, but one of them is that we don't pay more incentive for bringing in new business. So we pay mm-hmm. the same amount of commission or bonus or whatever you got for babysitting a customer we sold a decade ago and servicing that account and writing orders and renewals and playing account manager and, you know, zookeeper, like, you know, just protect the, the animals that already buy from us. We pay the same amount there as we do for the hard work of prospecting and opening up a brand new account or cross-selling into a growable customer, right? Where they only give us a little bit and then we double the business. And I think what happens is we have so many salespeople that are making a really good living, but they're not hungry. And then we complain as management, well, the salespeople aren't going after new business. And I'm like, yeah, because they're not hungry because they're living high on the hog. Like they, they're, they're fat, complacent, lazy because they're, they're milking their book of business or their portfolio or their territory, whatever you call it. And then the other thing on commission, I just got to go here, especially in your, in, your, in your world, in your audience. I see industrial type companies that have commission plans, but the commission is really an annuity. In other words, the salesperson doesn't have to get out of bed, but because of what you sell, right? You're the manufacturer or you're the distributor in a certain space. 
and you're really good, and that customer is going to buy your consumables, your abrasives, mm-hmm. your supplies, your product, whether your salesperson tries or not, because they like your company and they need what you sell. Mm-hmm. So the salesperson is earning commission every month, but I think the word earning is being used very loosely there because mm-hmm. they're going to get that money anyway. So I just call it an annuity. It's like, it's like a freebie. Mm-hmm. And I think mm-hmm. if you combine uh, not paying more for new sales and then commission annuities, we, th- we fool ourselves as leaders thinking that we're incenting behavior. You know, you say activities, right? But, mm-hmm. but we're not because they're not hungry and fat complacent salespeople don't hunt. They just protect what they have. So it's a big topic. Huge topic, huge topic. But I tell you what is, is from a sales organization leadership standpoint, it's one you got to lean into. And I just thought it was just, I thought it was brilliant the way you, you, you pulled that compensation. If you're seeing, you know, issues and complacency, look at the compensation plan. I just, I thought it was magnificent. It's just simple. I, I think we, I think we kid ourselves because there are a lot of execs or business owners in smaller companies that they don't want to deal with the compensation problem. And here's the mm-hmm. thing, and you, you and I, I'm sure we're in agreement on this. If the comp plan is well done, you want to write giant checks to your sales force. We Absolutely. should never, ever, ever as owners or executives begrudge a salesperson for making a lot of money because if you have a smart compensation plan, they're earning it. And if they're doing great, it means you're doing great. And so mm-hmm. design the plan that you want them to win with. But, but right. some of the problem is they, get, they resent it because salespeople are making a lot of money for not doing the right things. And that's not right. helping anybody. Right, right. I'm with you. Well, we could we could camp out there forever. So let's, well, let's. We should <laughs> it's a probably. Big, move it is a biggie. On. That is a big one. It's a biggie. I'm sure we sure. already made I people can... some pretty nervous right now. So, <laughs> yeah, I was hoping I'm not going to get called into a meeting because of this podcast. But that's okay. We'll we'll, we'll keep going forward. You know. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I like to kind of turn a little bit and talk about the management side too. And I want to start off with just a. I thought it was a funny question, but I, I, the more I thought about it and, and how I've been in interacted with these systems in the past i'd like to get your your input so is crm a dirty word uh it's probably not as dirty as i wrote it was in the book when i wrote the book probably five or six years ago but for a lot of companies it is because the system only takes but it doesn't give back Mm. you know what i'm saying Mm. like yeah it's 2022 right you need a system. You can't, you can't do your, your, your pipeline on a napkin. That's not a database. Like I, I get that it's, you know, there are some or spreadsheets spreadsheet. that work, yeah. but yeah. in today's world, it's come on. We all have smartphones. They, 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 we've come a long way and the CRMs are also much more user-friendly. Right. But, and the big, but is, but companies don't enforce compliance or they set it up in such a stupid way that it becomes a you know, a CRM jockey nightmare where you're basically creating all this work for salespeople that doesn't help them do their job. It just gathers info. And then this is the giant sin of them all. You tell the salespeople, you got to use a CRM. We're going to enforce it. And, and then when you really need information as an executive, you send out an email with a spreadsheet attached. You go, I need, I need everybody to get this back to me by tomorrow because we, we're doing some projections and the CFO is concerned or the plant's got supply chain issues. So I, everyone, I need you to fill this out. And then I'm thinking, what the heck? You yell at me about the CRM. You make me put all my stuff on there. And then when you really want info, you don't go to the CRM because you don't know how to use it either. You, you, you ask me to fill out a spreadsheet. I'm like, come on. So the, it's a long answer, right? And I'm, I'm glad we, we're chuckling about it, but it's not necessarily a dirty word. If it helps you organize your thinking and your attack plan and you capture notes in there and it keeps mm-hmm. you, and I'm not the most organized guy. I'm a sales hunter. Like I'm scattered, right? But if you have some systems in place, you can be more efficient and it yes. helps you keep track of stuff. So I don't know if that answers your question or just as entertaining, but I, I, I'm happy to go down that path further if you'd like. I mean, for, it, it helps me for sure, because I mean, as I have an engineering background, so process. So you're smart. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, well, I don't <laughs> want to say I'm smart. I, you know, I was able to, you know, D equals diploma, right? You know, so I was able to get through it, but uh, it's one of those things too, from selling, you know, we, we, we made a little in-home CRM 15 years ago, you mm-hmm. know, when I first started business development and, but it gave insight and it really gave me insight on where I was spending too much time where I, and then where I wasn't spending enough time. And that little bitty system is a little bitty homemade access system, but that actually provided value. So I didn't mind as a salesperson at the time inputting data because I was getting something out of it. And that's the biggest thing that I'm seeing that is just like there, 
where's the value coming out? And, and you just spoke to that. Yeah, I think you said it. If it's a big brother system, nobody wants that. But if mm-hmm. it's giving you back organization, strategy, ability to segment accounts, easier, faster follow-up, and it's helping you make money, then that's a great tool. And we should be thankful for those. And listen, I'm 55. I'm not a young man anymore, right? And I, But I got some sales guys I'm coaching in their mid-60s. And you know what? They've turned the corner on technology. And this is going to sound really weird, but COVID helped. There mm-hmm. are some old guys and old gals that have been in this forever. That were, and they were so hesitant about technology. And as much as the whole COVID thing has been a nightmare, one of the benefits is it helps some people get over the hump on using technology and being mm-hmm. more efficient and trying stuff because they had to to survive. And now mm-hmm. they've mastered it and I'm seeing them do a lot better. And that's honestly yeah. one of the benefits that's come out of it. For sure. And I've seen that firsthand as well, too. And, you know, speaking to the whole, you know, sales management coaching standpoint, you know, you mentioned in your book, but I'm curious to to, to just unpack for listeners when those lines do get blurred, because they do. And oftentimes we'll take the best salesperson and we'll just make them the manager, you know, and that's something I've seen that you just completely blow up. So I'm like, oh, I don't know if that's the best thing to do. So, you know, speak to that. What happens when those lines do get blurred between sales management and sales? You are asking about all the biggies, man. This is that's like jumping in the deep, deep end of the pool. Um, here's, here's how I say it. Chris, the, I think the only thing similar between the job of a salesperson and the job of a sales manager is the word sales. If you think about how a salesperson succeeds, being selfish, being focused on their own results, right? Their own customers, owning their calendar, like that's awesome. And if you look at how a sales manager succeeds, and this is why I struggled early in my sales management career, you don't win on your own by being selfish. You win through your people, mm-hmm. right? It's totally different. You have to be other-centered and reduce your ego when you're mm-hmm. a manager and, and make your team the hero. You can't be the hero. But in sales, you want them to be the hero. So it's very complicated. And I listen, I have, I have a lot of small companies I work with and a lot of dealerships or branches mm-hmm. where there's just not enough salespeople on staff to have a full-time sales manager. So Uh oftentimes they'll have someone who's a leader kind of play part-time sales manager and salesperson. And I Mm -hmm. get it because it just, the the money isn't there to have a full-time person, but it's never optimal because when, when Mm -hmm. you're the manager and the salesperson, the way I say it is you've kind of got to be partly schizophrenic because how do you know how to spend your day? Are you, are you about you and your business and your, your commission and your sales quota? Or are you about the team that you're supposed to be building into, developing, holding accountable, and helping them make their numbers? Like, which is it? And some of the way people answer that is, is it, well, it depends how you pay me. If you pay me on my own book of business and my own sales results, rest assured, that's where I'm going to spend more of my time. But if I'm being paid on the team numbers, well, then I might refocus a little bit. And it's very hard to go back and forth between selfish selling and selfless managing and leading. And that's where it gets goofy. And then sometimes it gets even worse where, sometimes the manager who's also selling ends up like competing with his or her own people. You know, like a new customer shows up where you get a great lead and the manager goes, huh, I think I'll keep this one for me. And all of a sudden the people on your team start thinking, well, you're taking food off their plate. Now, how's that going to work from a morale and culture perspective, right? So, I mean, I, I touched on a few things there, but I'm generally very weary of having part time selling sales managers or doing both jobs because the jobs are really different. They really are. They really are. I mean, and when, the, when the lines get blurred, you know, feelings can get hurt, you know, and, and, and I think we just miss an opportunity if we're in sales management and to coach and to mentor and to, to, to really help that development of that next generation. And, you know, maybe speak to that, you know, how can that sales management be that coach, be that mentor in the moment? Cause sometimes I've actually had to do this in the past too, where I've seen, you know, I've been on a sales calls and perfect and purposely let it fail because that was a better opportunity. It, Cause I knew it in the big scale of things, you know, uh, it was a better, I, I was serving the salesperson better by letting them just work, work through that. And then, you know, post diagnosing it, you know, after the call. So, because I know we'd be able to go back and fix it versus trying to jump in, in the moment and be the hero. Cause I feel like that's what we, we, we naturally gravitate to, but that's not really the best way to learn, at least in my experience. I, what, what's your take? That's so strong. I hope people go back and just re-listen to that last minute of you sharing that because 
I, I can't say that any better. I, you're rare. I'll tell you, first of all, you must be an amazing coach. I'll say that. And second of all, you and I are in the minority because I actually teach mm -hmm. this like in big workshops mm -hmm. and I preach the same thing that you do, that sometimes the teaching lesson of letting the salesperson fail on that sales call is more valuable than saving that little deal. And I often get arguments They're like, no, 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 you can't let them fail. They'll never trust you again. And you know, you, how could you let a deal go down? And I'm thinking, cause I'm trying to teach you how to fish. And sometimes if we That's go right. to bed hungry, he'll fish better the next day than me catching all his fish. That's the whole thing. Are you the hero or are you mm -hmm. turning your guy into a hero? Are you catching mm -hmm. his fish? Or are you teaching him to fish? So I love mm -hmm. that you're going down that path. And, and I think there's times in a sales call where you do rescue it, right? You, you oh, save yeah. it, you show them how it's done. Or if it's a really big deal, we don't want to lose it. But I'm right. with you. I think sometimes the value of letting it fail. So you have a teaching moment and they actually have some pain and maybe even a little embarrassment. So they're more open to be coached. I think that's brilliant. Sure. But the bigger picture, which I think you started to go down this path, where did all the mentoring and coaching go? I mean, mm -hmm. let, let's just be honest. A lot of my sales success, I was a top sales guy in three companies. Do you know who I credit with that? Mentors, sales mm -hmm. managers, presidents, coaches, my dad, other guys in my life that were like, here's how you sell. And today we're all so busy and I'm holding up my cell phone for, the, for those of you mm -hmm. watching the video, right? We're, we're all addicted to this. We all get yep. 97,000, you know, direct messages and emails a day. And sales managers run around with their hair on fire. They're buried in corporate crap. They never get to coach. Mm -hmm. And in the old days, sales managers used to brag, oh, I had this young kid. I mentored him. I turned him into a star. Or I had this guy that was struggling. And I, I helped get him turned around. And now he's doing great. Do you know how rarely I hear that kind of story today? Mm -hmm. A sales manager bragging about how they developed somebody and mentored him or got somebody turned around. And I'm like, that's the job. The job is accountability. The job is team meetings. The job is coaching. Those are the high impact things. And they're so busy, they mm. never get to coaching. They're just running sure. around, going to meetings, fighting corporate fires and playing email jockey. That's not sales That's management. Right. You're, you're all over. And I, one thing that I've, I've started doing more and more of, Mike, is role playing. And I don't know if you see value in that, but I mean, I, I've, I've taken the opportunity to with the, the guys that I work with and, and have the, the opportunity to oversee and, and have, uh, you know, oversight to just do some role playing is because we can't get in the field as often as we want, but trying to put them in those uncomfortable situations with me. And, you know, if we stumble with me, that's okay. It's a learning opportunity because I'm, I'm trying to create those, those moments of those aha or those, Oh crap moments rather of, you know, I shouldn't have said that and, and, and learn from there. So I'm not sure if you've seen more and more people do that as well. I, I, I do, and I wish more were doing it. And here's just one little tip I use for managers. Because people seem to like have a really weird reaction to the phrase role play. I don't know what it is, but every time we say role play, salespeople freak out. I don't want to do that. That's acting. I don't want to be on the spot in front of my peers, in front of my manager. So I do the same thing as role play. I just don't call it role play. I okay. call it practice. Hey, let's practice that. Let's practice that real quick. And I use this go. analogy. I'm, you know, I'm the simple guy. I'm like, Think about like the, I'm into golf. I'm trying to become a golfer. Like I'm a little late in life, but I, you know, I'm a 15 handicap. I've come a long way down from shooting a hundred to shooting in the, you know, high eighties, 90. And I got a long way to go, but I, I'm studying all these professional golfers. They spend 99% of their time practicing 1% of their time competing, right? It's all the range. It's chipping, it's putting, it's working on the swing and salespeople. I never see them practice. They right. practice on the customer. They right. don't stay up at night. They don't run mock sales calls. They don't leave themselves voicemail messages and listen and do it 20 times until they get it right. They go out with on live customers and practice and screw it up. And I'm like, let's work on this in private so we're good when we get in front of the customer. Like that's not right. a crazy concept. Right. But no one wants to do it. And we're awkward with role play. I love that you do it. I just call it practice because I think it it doesn't somehow they hear practice and they don't freak out like when they hear role play. So that's my right. own little trick. I'll start using that. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna change. I'm gonna change it right now because I, I still do get people get to freaking out on that. But uh, anyway, I, that's I funny. Fun you, they do it. though, don't they? It's like they don't. It's oh, something yeah. about the phrase. Yeah, that's right. I'm like, look, man, it's all good. You know, you'll still be you. I'm not asking you to be us. I'll be the different person. Don't worry. It's okay. You know, that's great. <laughs> so, well, I tell you what, Mike, this has been a just a fun conversation. I've learned a lot. We we've shared a lot with our listeners. We call it Eco Ask Why we because we always wrap up with the why. So I'm curious to get this from you. So. You know, why is it important for industry, you know, to step back a little bit 
and see how they can simplify that sales strategy strategy to drive meaningful results. Because that's how you win. And sales is about results. And you know what? We're really important. And I'm always reminding salespeople, you have the most important job in the economy. You yeah. drive the business and you bring value to your company and to your customer and you provide for your family. And honestly, if you're representing another, you know, a company, everyone else's livelihood is depending on you as the salesperson doing your job because you're the mm-hmm. only one that can make revenue happen. So it's critical. And when we simplify things, we can execute them, right? And, mm-hmm. there, and there's even today, if you think of all the things we talked about and you asked amazing questions, we covered so much ground. There's nothing we talked about that somebody couldn't implement tomorrow. There's no rocket science here. This is like basic addition one plus one plus one. And if you get that basic stuff nailed down, you always win. You always right. bring in more new sales. So that's why, and my, my passion, like you said, what, what's the why? My why in business, it's helping salespeople win more new sales. That's why mm-hmm. I do what I do because the fun and the freedom and the financial reward goes to the seller who can bring in more new sales. Anybody right. can babysit a customer. But you go create business and make something happen. You're so valuable to yourself, to your company, to the customer, to the economy. I love it. I love it. Mike, this has been great. Now, where, where do we want to point people? We'll put it in our show notes. But where should they go to learn more and connect with you and, and, and to help their organizations? Well, let me just start by saying thanks. This has been such an energizing conversation. I think my, the rest of my day is going to be like on cloud nine from, from chatting with you. So thank you. Um, <laughs> yes, sir. My website's got pretty much everything. It's mikeweinberg.com, okay. W. E-I-N-B-E-R-G, MikeWeinberg.com. And on social stuff, it's Mike underscore Weinberg. That's that's the best place to go. Okay. And we'll make sure those links are in the show notes for you listeners out there. So Mike, it's been a blessing. Thank you so much for everything that you unpacked here today. Uh, my new friend, thanks for having me. All the best to you and tons of new sales to the listeners. Okay, everybody. I know what you're thinking. Did that really just happen? And let me tell you, yes, it did. That was a, just a, what a powerful conversation with Mike. I mean, we connected. It, the energy was high. And the value was just tremendous. So go back, get a, grab a pen, grab a paper, get ready to do some writing. Because if you implement a few of these areas that Mike talked about, I mean, he unpacked a ton, it will help you. Bottom line, it will serve you well. Be sure to go to the show notes, check out those resources. Because I'm telling you what, his book, Sales Management Simplified, just the one I, that I referenced, has impacted me greatly. There's a lot of value there. So Hope, hope you all enjoyed that as much as I did. It was a fun conversation. Probably one of the funnest that I've had on Eco Ask Why. And I just, I just, I'm hopeful that it serves you and that you, you get a ton of value from it. Now, the war stories, we still want them. Go to, our, to, to the show notes. You'll be able to connect with us directly there. And we want to hear from you. The good, the bad, the ugly. Maybe it's a sales story. You know, tell us a funny sales story. We like to share those too. You know, because I mean, there's things that happen in sales that we just need to learn from. And what better way to do than sharing from stories? Mike, we literally talked about that, the impact of stories and how that can help us all grow, all get better. That's what it's all about. That's what Eco SY is all about. Give us a rating, write a review. That really makes an impact. Keep listening, keep sharing, and keep asking why.